Welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Michael Jones, who's also a CPA. And uh, Michael is a partner in his own firm, uh, Thompson Jones LLP, a husband and wife team. Uh, they're located in Monterey, California. His tax consulting practice focuses on sophisticated wealth transfer strategy, trust and probate matters, and family business transitions. Uh, Mike is the CPA that top estate attorneys go to and also other tax practitioners with their tax and litigation problems. He's sort of the uh, hired gun. Anyway, <laughs> Mike is the author of Guide to Electing Out of the 2010 Estate Tax and uh, Final Regulations Governing Minimum Required Distributions, a special supplement to the Pension Answer Book chair of the Trust and Estates Magazine's Retirement Benefits Committee, Committee. And he's been quoted in newspapers like the New York Times, Forbes Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg Financial Report, and others. And uh, in his other life, <laughs> Mike is an avid prone paddleboarder and surfer. And uh, I have to say, Mike also provided some invaluable comments for a book I just came out with. It's called How to Use Roth and IRA accounts to provide a secure retirement. And Mike helped me to uh, put some very valuable information in there. So Mike, thanks so much for your input for that. Um, I went to a conference recently. It was the Kasner Estate Planning Symposium and Mike was participating on a panel uh, talking about community property and, uh, and retirement accounts. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Mike, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Okay. Now, before we get started, uh, caution to our viewers again. This is pretty technical stuff that we're talking about. Um, that hasn't stopped me before. <laughs> but uh, we're only going to hit some highlights. And so we want you to see your attorney and other tax advisors. Uh, now we're talking about community property and there's only eight states which include California. Uh, they have community property laws and those rules even vary from state to state. There are ten. Oh there's ten, excuse yes. me. I stand corrected. Thank you Mike. Nine of them have community property and Alaska is the one that's the most recent addition and theirs is elective. Okay, thank you for that. Mike and I are California CPAs. We're most familiar with California community property. We're not lawyers, and so um, again, uh, so be alert as far as that's concerned. The main message, I'll put it up front, so you don't have to wait, <laughs> don't have to guess. Estate planning and administration isn't a do-it-yourself job. Um, it's essential to work with a knowledgeable attorney. So that's what we really want to tell you today, and now we're going to go ahead and get into some of our questions uh, to persuade you that, yeah, maybe I do need to get some help. Okay. All right, Mike, first of all, what is community property? Community property is a form of property ownership that's peculiar to community property states. Um, it started in some of the countries in Europe, such as Spain and uh, Germany uh, and France. We, of course, have the Spanish variety in California. And it was instituted in order to resolve disputes that were happening that the easiest way to deal with is said, look, if you're married, it belongs to half of each of you. In California, we codified that in something called the family the law or the family code. And what it means essentially is that each partner in a marriage and now more recently each partner in a registered domestic partnership uh, will have community property for any status for any property that they acquire during their marital or their partnership relationship. So it's essentially a presumption that anything that you acquire during that term of that relationship is going to be community property. The presumption can be overcome, uh, by, uh, it, but, but it, it places the burden of proof on the person who wants to assert that it's separate property instead of community property. There is some property that you can acquire during your relationship which is not community property. Specifically, the one that comes to mind for me is inherited property, is, is typically separate property and not community property. You can also switch back and forth between community property and separate property uh, 
by doing something that the family law code calls a transmutation. And these days, so, since somewhere during the late last century, I forget which year, uh, you have to do that in writing and it has to refer to it being a transmutation in order to change its status from community to separate property, for example. Right. Okay, so, uh, like I said, pretty technical, uh, but mostly any property that you acquire, mostly from your efforts, like when you work, you know, your wages, that sort of thing, and then that's invested in your home and so forth, uh, is going to be community property. Generally speaking, and also if you take separate property and you commingle it with community property, it can convert it to community property. Right, yeah, so you can have these little transmutations and so forth, these conversions. And so you need to use a lot of care about uh, how you handle your property. And again, this is why it's important to get good legal advice. Okay, well, why is this business, why is the status of property as community property important? Well, first of all, to do anything with the property, you need the, uh, you need the cooperation of both partners. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if the relationship breaks up, such as in a divorce with a married couple, then community property is generally divided in half. Um, in this state, it, can, it doesn't have to be divided on an asset-by-asset -asset basis, but essentially the idea is that each partner is going to get half the value of all the property. Mm -hmm. um, it also has to do with what you're able to give away during your lifetime to someone else or what you can leave to someone upon your death. Mm -hmm. And then finally, it has to do with what's includable in your taxable estate, which is an area that I do a fair amount of work in, with, is with the estates. And so there, if I have community property with my spouse, it is my half of my community property which would form part of my taxable estate. My spouse's half of the community property would not be on that estate tax return. It would not be subject to tax until she dies. Great. Okay, thank you. Now, why is community property especially complicated for retirement accounts? Well, several, several reasons. Um, the world of retirement accounts sort of breaks into plans that are um, sponsored by employers and are covered by the employment, the employee, the Employee Retirement Security Act, the ERISA mm -hmm. of 1974, which has a set of rules that preempt community property, which we'll go into in a bit uh, further down our, our discussion. And then kind of what happens to most accounts is most of us do, thank heavens, get to retirement. Mm -hmm. And when we do, a lot of us will roll our retirement accounts into an IRA. Mm -hmm. IRAs are not protected by ERISA for the most part. And uh, you, would, you would have a um, community property interest pretty much in the IRA once it comes out. Right. So one of the things related to this, though, is where the beneficiaries are stated and so forth. So, you know, like is a retirement account usually covered by a will or a trust? Um, it can be, but sometimes it's not. Uh, the retirement accounts rights are supposed to be fixed according to its beneficiary designation, and that's where a good deal of litigation has happened, particularly with the ERISA-covered accounts, but even with the IRAs as well. I have a case on my desk right now where a trust was named as the beneficiary of a retirement account, which was the separate property of the individual who has died. Her husband, her surviving spouse, is claiming that it was community property. The firm that holds the IRA, which is a large investment firm, takes the position that we're going to assume that this is community property until someone can prove to us that it's something else. Mm -hmm. So right away, for an account that's maybe worth under three or $400,000 in this case, it creates a really large and expensive mess because no one clarified all those things before death occurred. Right. Okay, now another thing is what about uh, retirement accounts with change in marital status? Doesn't that also sort of put a monkey wrench in things or make things very difficult? You mean as from... So maybe a person, let's say uh, uh, they were uh, previously married and, and their spouse may have passed away, so now they've got an account that may have been their separate property, or, and now they remarry. So... Does that make the situation also more difficult and require like special accounting and that it, sort of stuff? Yeah, it can require some tracing and if it's a large enough account, hopefully before you got married, as with the rest of your property, you would have gone and seen a family law attorney mm 
and possibly an accountant and ask what you need to do to keep your separate property or separate property if that is in fact your attention your intentions right so again we were saying when you're thinking of getting married I mean this is romantic we're not supposed to be thinking about money <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> As we know, no marriages ever occur for financial reasons. <laughs> okay. Um, what's the impact of the Retirement Equity Act, or the I guess the nickname is RIA? Or REACT. Yeah, or REACT. That was also called the Geraldine Ferraro Act. Okay. <laughs> During that campaign when she was, uh, I believe, running for vice president. Um, that one got penciled in and passed rather quickly. Uh, my dear late friend Jerry Kasner indicated that it wasn't very well written. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> but it essentially says that for a plan which is covered by ERISA, which are most of our employer uh, produced plans are, most of the plans that are offered by employers, must have a provision in there that says your surviving spouse gets at a minimum a qualified joint and survivor annuity, 50% at the level of the participants or the employee's annuity. So that's one right that they have, or in the alternative, half the account mm -hmm. at a minimum. So there's really nothing that you could put on a, on a beneficiary designation form that would defeat that. It protects the rights of spouses in, in retirement plans. But once you roll that to, into an IRA, that's gone. So that's mm -hmm. the part that wasn't written so well. Okay. But the other th uh, point related to this is generally um, you want to have a spouse's consent for a beneficiary designation. Uh, Unless, of really course, it is the spouse. Unless, of course, it is the spouse. Right. Okay. So if you wish to leave an IRA or, excuse me, a, 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 an employer-sponsored retirement plan to someone besides your spouse, you need to have what's called a waiver and consent. You're waiving the REA rights and then you're also consenting to the beneficiary designation. Okay. So just so you know, Mike, we're about halfway through our interview. Okay? Great. Now, um, what is the Boggs decision, and briefly, what's its impact on estate planning and administration? Boggs versus Boggs is a United States Supreme Court decision, and in that case, it was decided that it isn't possible to assert community property rights against an ERISA plan. What would happen was, was that Mrs. Boggs had died. She ostensibly had community property rights in her husband's ERISA-covered retirement plans. And she tried to dispose of half of those rights in her estate plan. And the Supreme Court said, in so many words, nothing doing. Mm -hmm. ERISA trumps that. It preempts the community property laws. And the benefits must pass by the plan's beneficiary designation and under no other rule. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Now, sorry folks, but uh, a lot of these rules that we talk about, they relate to cases. Uh, they're well known to practitioners, or at least there are a way for them to get into them and find them. And so that's why I'm asking Mike uh, by case a little bit. And also, he has a lot of familiarity with them. Uh, I've learned a lot about these cases from Mike. So, uh, Mike, maybe we can talk a little bit about the bunny decision. What's that all about? Well, in spite of the fact that it's Christmas, we're now talking about bunnies. Is that okay, what you're saying? Okay, right. That's, that's it. Well, fo folks, you'll be saying this sometime yes. after Christmas, but it is December 11th today. Yes. Uh, bunny versus Bunny was a decision that involved not an ERISA-covered plan, but an IRA. Individual retirement accounts are not covered by ERISA, and so it's possible to do more with the beneficiary designation. What happened there was this was not anything that happened on death. This was a divorce case. And um, what the case really tells us is that whatever partner puts the money into an IRA is the partner and the only partner who is ever going to pay income tax on what comes out of that IRA. The decision was later affirmed by the tax court who decided this case in another case called Angela Morris. Right. So most of the time, like if you look at the IRS instructions, uh, for filing a separate tax return and so forth in the worksheets, they say split community property items 50-50 for the two tax returns. But this is an exception that we more or less follow the money as far as how it's going to be reported. Is that right? You follow the title on the IRA is what you do. So yes, no matter who got the money, 
it was Mr. Bunny's IRA. Oh, okay. And therefore, he has to pay the income tax on whatever comes out of that IRA, even if it went to Mrs. Bunny. Oh, okay. Now, there are divorce rules where you can divide IRAs successfully, and she'll wind up having her own IRA, and he'll wind up having his own IRA, but that's not what happened in this case. Okay, good. Okay, I just want to be sure we were clear there. All right, now, uh, there's another uh, decision, and I guess it's been around for a while. It's called the McDonald decision. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. So that is a California Supreme Court case that says that you can't change an IRA from community property into separate property unless you actually have a signed transmutation agreement. So like other types of community property, basically we're saying, no, you've got to have one of these signed agreements. To change, right. To change it, yeah. Okay. Um, can a non-participant spouse direct a beneficiary for his or her share of an IRA in his or her will or trust? So I've got, uh, let's say I have an IRA and now my wife says, well, wait a minute, I have a community property interest in that IRA and she wants to direct who's going to be the beneficiary in her will or trust for my IRA. Can she do that? That's exactly what happened in McDonald and the Supreme Court upheld it. Okay. Um, Scratch that. Can we go back and erase that and do right. that one? No, we can't, but you can make a correction. Can, okay. Just go ahead and tell us. Oh, okay. That's not exactly what happened in McDonald, but yes, in an, it, that, that was, that's the opposite of the Boggs case. That's what Mrs. Boggs tried to do, is, yes. is to leave an interest in her husband's ERISA plan. Had it, had it been an, and he did have IRAs. The court, the Supreme Court didn't rule on the IRAs. But yes, I do believe that if you did make a, a disposition of the committee properties in the IRA, you would in fact be successful in that. Now, that could cause some income tax problems. And specifically, it could mean that even though the children from the first marriage of the spouse whose IRA is, isn't, got, gets half of the IRA, it's still, the same person's tax to pay. So you basically what you've done is you've changed who gets the IRA at some point in time, and yet the taxpayer is still unchanged. Mm -hmm. Okay. Believe it or not, Mike, we've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, so maybe you can share with us uh, uh, a case study uh, that you've been dealing with recently a problem related to uh, planning using these retirement accounts? Probably the most complex thing that I see is the revocable living trust. We, uh, we do see attorneys and their clients set up a lot of these as a will substitute in California. It seems to be dominant. Yes. And so uh, there may not necessarily be much discussion about what happens to the retirement plan or the IRA. So it can, in fact, get left out of the discussion because you can't really have a trust that you set up during your lifetime own an IRA. And you can't, certainly can't have it own a retirement plan that's coming from an employer. Mm -hmm. So the estate planning for that becomes quite complicated because that's sitting outside of the, of the trust. Mm -hmm. And it passes not by terms of the trust and not by terms of the will. It passes instead because of the way that the IRA beneficiary or the retirement plan beneficiary is filled out. So that several things can happen in that regard. Um, one of them is, is that if you look at the community as a whole, what's inside the trust and what's outside the trust, an imbalance can occur about the surviving spouse getting half of everything that there is. So for that reason, it's important to make sure that there's something in the estate planning documents that will deal with that right off the bat. And you want that in there because you never know how a client is going to handle their beneficiary form down the road. Right. They might do it right the first time and then change it later for some reason. Or you might tell them how to do it right, but they never follow through and do it. The next thing that I see is naming a trust as the beneficiary of an IRA or naming an estate as beneficiary of the IRA. But the most common thing that I see is the IRA beneficiary form never gets filled out. Right, so what happens then? So what happens is, is that the beneficiary form itself, or in the case of a retirement plan from an employer, 
there is something somewhere that says what happens to those dollars if you did not fill out the beneficiary form. So bottom line, there is a beneficiary. You just didn't fill one out and name one yourself. In some cases, that might be the surviving spouse if there is one, or if none, your descendants or your children. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, if not most cases in my experiences, it's not individuals at all. It's the estate of the person who owned the plant. Right. And that's a tax disaster because when an estate is the beneficiary of an IRA or retirement plan, the money has to come out of that plan in almost all cases much, much faster than if they had named an individual or even a trust as a beneficiary. Right. So if you don't have a name beneficiary, well, if you do have a name beneficiary, then there's this possibility of having basically an, an actuarial, a lifetime distribution. Whereas if you don't, then was it five years? To you can end? wind up with the five-year rule. And so just to quickly go over that, if the IRA owner, and I'll use the IRA as a substitute for most plans. So if the IRA owner dies before reaching the time when their requirement, their required minimum distributions must start, and that's called a required beginning date, in most cases, that's April 1st of the year of, after the year when you turn age 70 and a half. Right. If you die before that date, then the default rule is all the money has to be distributed out of that tax favored account within five years of your death. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've named an individual as a beneficiary of that plan, that individual in most cases, not all, but almost all cases, has the right to take those distributions instead of over five years, they can take it over that beneficiary's remaining life expectancy. Right. So if I could get everyone to get off their chairs that's listening to this to do one thing and one thing only, it would be to go make sure that you have a beneficiary form filled out so that your intentions are being carried out and do consult your attorney and your accountant about that. Right. So it's it's easy to procrastinate about these things. Oh, I'll get around to it someday or what have you. But, uh, but it is really important to pay attention to this and particularly these beneficiary forms because they have you know, a, a very important effect in carrying out your wishes. And if it's not done, somebody else may not really totally straighten it out and, and so your family is going to suffer the consequences. Yes, my friend attorney Steve Crass from the East Coast, New York City, tells me that's exactly what happened to John Denver. He never got around to naming a beneficiary on his plans. Nope. How about that? He was Fortun too, too busy writing songs and traveling. <laughs> and unfortunately flying airplanes. Yeah. Um, his beneficiary form uh, wasn't filled out, but the plan said to spouse and then to children, so that saved the day for them. But it could have gone the other way. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to clarify, because uh, I think you, that this is the point that you were talking about before. So... In general, the idea when we're dividing property, when somebody passes away, is that the decedent's half is being uh, distributed or whatever, or, or administered. And so, but in California, it doesn't have to be determined on an asset by asset basis. In other words, it doesn't have to be half of the residence and half of this car or what have you. You can sort of compensate using different assets. And so when an IRA may be going to, let's just say to a child, uh, according to the instructions of the decedent, okay, ben, uh, spouse, decedent spouse, then the living spouse sh should be able to make up for that IRA using other assets. Is that the idea that you were talking about? Um, you need to actually say something about that in the trust document because yeah. if you don't, you're going to have an inequality. What will happen is the child, in your example, will get 100% of the IRA, and what's left over in the trust is what's going to get divided 50-50. Or alternatively, if the spouse is named as the beneficiary of the IRA, the spouse will get the entire IRA and still get half of whatever else is in the trust. So unless you have an adjustment clause in the trust, that's something that can happen. Yeah, so that, I think that's the point that we wanted people to be aware uh, that this is an important thing for your estate plan. Uh, and uh, a lot of attorneys are doing this these days as part of their forms. But you want to uh, look for this provision. Is, is, is there some sort of an equalization uh, that's there in the event of something like this happening? Right. Okay.
May I back up a little bit before yes. we finish sure, up and cover? Sure. In the situation, if you're in that situation where the estate was named as the beneficiary, and someone out there is going to actually see that because it happens fairly often, the question will arise, is there some way to save that situation? And there may be. Mm -hmm. Once it goes to an estate, you then look at the will and figure out from the will if it's possible to direct that IRA to the surviving spouse. And if you can do that, the surviving spouse can roll it over to an IRA of the surviving spouse, and that will get you out of the box. Right. So there have been some specific IRS rulings on this. The IRS, uh, it seems, will bend over backwards to help the surviving spouse to accomplish a rollover to the, his or her account. Provided you have yeah. the right facts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mike, I want to thank you so much for uh, being my guest today. Actually, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. It's and, a pleasure and an yeah, honor. Uh, Mike really has quite a reputation in, uh, with the CPAs and with the attorneys in the area folks. So uh, this is uh, really sort of a guru type person. He, he will be very modest about it. But anyway, uh, he speaks for our estate planning group each year uh, as an update. And so I just really high, highly respect him and his opinions. Folks, I hope you join us next time on Financial Insider Weekly.